Thank you, Scott. Um, hi, my name is Maggie. And I'm Daniel. And our research was based on inorganic synthesis. And the title was The Characterization of Metal Acetate Salts, um, Copper, Zinc, Cobalt, and Nickel, with 2-methylthio and 3-pyridinyl methylacetamide, and 2-methylthio and 4-pyridinyl methylacetamide. And for the sake of time, I'll just be calling those the three and four ligands. So our goal of, the, of this research was to produce inorganic synthesis with metal acetate salts and with a ligand. And in essence, a ligand is basically a molecule that attaches to a metal ion. Now, these metal acetates have a unique characteristic, and that's that they have these paddle wheel structures that aren't usually seen in many molecules. Now, as you can see here in the copper, the copper exhibits that paddle wheel structure the best. However, the zinc, cobalt, and nickel uh, exhibit the, the paddle wheel structure uh, fairly well as well. Okay, so the um, ligands we used, we used two methyl CO and three pyridinyl methyl acetamides, the three ligand, and two methyl CO and four pyridinyl methyl acetamides, the four ligands. And so the basic anatomy of a ligand is, where is Okay, this right here is the head of the ligand, and right here is the tail of the ligand. And the difference between the two is where the tail attaches to the head. So this is the four ligand because it's one, two, three, four, and the three ligand is one, two, three. And so the um, parts of the ligand that would attach to the metal acetate are the sulfur and the nitrogen. And so, ultimately, our goal of this research was to create coordination complexes in either chains, sheets, or three-dimensional um, structures. So what coordination complexes are, are essentially metal ions connected by ligands, and they can all form these sheets or chains, or um, if these were to stack on top of each other like crystal lattices, they could create three-dimensional structures as well. So. Essentially what we're doing here is replacing the typical metal ion within these coordination complexes with the metal acetate. And of course the ligands will be using the three and four ligands. Okay, so we began our experiment by purifying the um, metal acetates that we used. So, um, and inorganic chemistry is known for its beautiful colors, so these crystals are so beautiful. <laughs> So for the copper, we got a 28.1% yield. The cobalt, oops, the cobalt, we got a 55.46% yield. The nickel, we got a 33.337% yield. And for the zinc, crystallizing zinc was sort of like climbing Mount Everest for us. It's really hard once you get there. It's really cool. So <laughs> um, for our first zinc experiment, we got a 73.3% yield and the crystals were in a needle-like structure. And for a second, we got um, crystal, zinc crystals with a 39.86% yield and polygonal structure. And we are get, we're assuming the reason for this difference in structures is the different amount of water contained in the crystal lattices. So after we purified the metal acetates, we had the responsibility of actually creating the three and four ligands, or um, synthesizing them. So, as you can see here, we created a solution of three amino methyl pyridine and methyl acetic, acetic, acetic acid and triethylamine, EDCHCl, and HOBT. So, in this solution, the triethylamine, EDC, and HOBT are acting as the um, coupling reagents in that they're going to be helping these two molecules attach. And as you can see here, the three ligand is displayed at the bottom of the slide, and you can clearly see that the three amino methyl pyridine acts as the head of the ligand, as Maggie was describing, and the methyl acetic acid acts as the tail of the ligand. And so they're going to be connecting where the NH2 and the HO are and form a crude form of the three ligand that we're attempting to synthesize. Now, this crude ligand has a lot of impurities and a lot of urea waste in it, and so after we synthesize this ligand and cooled it down to zero degrees Celsius, we allow it to cool back, or we allow it to warm back up to room temperature, um, and eventually we wash it with dichloromethane, and we get the pure ligand here, and this is the form of the ligand dissolved in methanol. 
And afterwards, in order to confirm that what we have in the solution is actually the three ligand and not some other compound, we run it through a proton NMR, um, which is a nuclear magnetic resonance. And essentially what this does is it characterizes the molecule and ensures that what we have is the um, three ligand. So as you can see here, these peaks are representative of the hydrogen groups and how many other hydrogen groups they're um, next to. Um, the x-axis has parts per million on it, and as you get farther to the right, you lose electronegativity, and as you get farther to the left, you gain electronegativity. And so as you can see here, the A and B hydrogen groups are going to have the most electronegativity as they're near to the other, hydro of the other hydrogen groups, and the G over here is going to have the least amount of electronegativity simply because it's at the end of the tail and it's not going to be as near to the other hydrogen group. Okay, so we also had to synthesize the four ligand. And so our procedure was basically the same as the three ligand. The only difference was we used four amino methylpyridine instead of three amino methylpyridine because the four amino methylpyridine is the chemical that characterizes the four ligand. So we also um, cooled this to zero degrees and washed it to get urea and other contaminants out of it. And so our final product, when it was dissolved in methanol, looks like this. And we also took an MNR, NMR of the ligand. And NMRs are basically like fingerprinting a mo like a molecule because no two molecule or no two substances or compounds have the same NMR. And so through this, we were able to determine that we did have a pure four ligand. Now, after we purified the acetate and synthesized the ligand, we had the responsibility of actually starting the inorganic synthesis. So we started by dissolving all of the acetates in methanol, and we did the same with the three and four ligands. And so essentially what we did was we mixed each acetate solution with each ligand solution. And with that, we were supposed to have eight solutions. But unfortunately, the three ligand, um, well, we had the responsibility of putting the three ligand on a heating mantle and ensuring that all of the solvent was evaporated off. Um, and we were told that it was supposed to go to 80, 80 degrees Celsius. And so, of course, the knob on the heating mantle was turned to 80 but unfortunately, that denotes 80 volts. And so 80 volts was run through our three ligand, and it was charred and burnt and unusable. And so the three ligand wasn't used for the cobalt acetate, and so we were only able to have inorganic synthesis performed for seven of the acetates. And um, due to time constraints, we weren't able to leave the solutions to crystallize. Instead, they su simply supersaturated, and so those are the solutions that we use to analyze with the um, IRs and the UV visits. Okay. So um, to get our results, we rotovast the solutions and then we dissolve them in acetyl nitrile in order to take a infrared spectroscopy and a UV vis spectroscopy of them. And so all of our um, compounds, all of our experiments were successful except for our cobalt, which failed. And so, as Maggie was saying, what we see here is the infrared spectroscopy of the, of the um, nickel acetate. And on the x-axis, you'll see the wave numbers, so the wavelength, in essence. And the y-axis, you'll see the percent transmittance, so the amount of light that passed through the solution. And so, what this IR does is it characterizes the, the metal acetate or any other um, compound that you put into it. And uh, like the NMR, it's basically a fingerprint and allows us to identify whether or not the inorganic synthesis took place. So as you can see here, the waves are um, seen in 3000s, 2000s, and 1000s, and these peaks are characteristic of the nickel acetate. However, if we we're to look at the nickel acetate with the three ligand, um, we can see that many more peaks have formed from 3000 to 2000, um, and this indicates that the inorganic synthesis was uh, most likely successful and that a new substance has been formed. Um, we're not completely sure that a new substance has been formed. However, we do know that the nickel acetate and the um, ligand has interacted in one way or another. So we're going to contrast those IRs with our cobalt IRs because our cobalt failed. 
And so the IR for our cobalt looks like this, and the IR for, for our cobalt with the four ligands looks like this. Um, the peaks were a little bit shifted between the two, but they were not shifted enough to determine that a complex had been formed. Also, the ligand peak did not appear, so we determined that the um, a complex had not been formed with the cobalt and the four ligands. We also uh, took a UV vis spectroscopy, which is basically the ultraviolet version of the infrared spectroscopy. And as you see here, um, the Y axis denotes the absorbance in absorbance units, and the X axis also absorbs or also denotes wavelength in nanometers. So what we were able to do is run each of the inorganic syntheses through the UV vis, and we were able to characterize that the ligand is going to be found from 300 to 400. Um, as you can see right here, there's a bump on each of these graphs, and we uh, speculated that these will most likely be the ligands um, within the inorganic synthesis. So, in conclusion, we um, were able to determine that all of our experiments did form complexes, except for our cobalt. Um, we, however, are not sure if a um, polymers, dimers, or monomers were formed due to time constraints. Um, however, we are guessing that the three ligand, when um, combined with an acetate metal, did form a polymer because it was very, the solution was very turbid, and polymers are generally less soluble than um, other than monomers and polymers. I mean, dimers. My bad. Okay, so we are also guessing that cobalt did not, um, may not have bonded due to steric hindrance, which is basically there are so many groups bonded to the cobalt that there was no room for the ligand to really bond to the cobalt. However, um, we are guessing also that if the co cobalt was um, mixed with the three ligand, a bond would not have been formed, but since we don't have the three ligand, we couldn't really say. Um, also, in the future, we would hope to crystallize our experiments and send them to an extra crystallography lab so we could determine the structure of the crystals and we could also determine if the cobalt's inability to bond with the four ligand was due to steric hindrance. So, you may be asking why this is important. Um, why do we need to characterize these uh, ligands and these metal acetates? Well, the main thing that's being researched right now is their storage capabilities. Now, if we were actually able to form coordination complexes, the storage capabilities of these coordination complexes could be further analyzed. Now, these, since these coordination complexes have spaces in between the ligands and the metals, hydrogen or any other atom is able to, is, is able to um, store themselves within the, within the bonds of the coordination complexes. And so these, uh, this, this can be applied to uh, hydrogen fuel cells, for example. Now, hydrogen fuel cells present themselves in gaseous and liquid states right now, but solid states is something that's um, very difficult to achieve. However, if we, were to able to, if we were able to store hydrogen within these bonds for coordination complexes, it's possible that we could form a solid state of hydrogen fuel, which would be much less um, combustible than the liquid and gaseous forms, and it would be um, a lot more safe. And the same, um, the same principle can be applied to catalysis, and so catalyzing agents can be applied within these and form a solid state of those catalyzing agents and help speed up reactions. And as for the magnetic coupling characteristics of the paddle wheel structures, um, the paddle wheel structures actually have a very strong magnetic coupling characteristic, and so if these were to be further analyzed, they could also assist in the storage capabilities, and um, we could see if it has any effect in the coordination complexes. Okay, so for acknowledgments, we would like to thank Dr. Hauser and Mount Wallace for everything they have done and their mentorship through these six weeks. Um, we'd also like to thank Chib, Brian, and Ernie for helping us around the lab. Um, I personally would like to thank Nobel Energy for sponsoring both my research and my stay here at UNC. 
And I would like to thank Dr. Davidson for sponsoring my stay here at FSI and the Edward Magellan Foundation for sponsoring this research. And I would also like to thank the staff uh, for everything they have done. We wouldn't have been able to do it without you guys. Um, you helped us a lot through everything with all of your support. So 